Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos, and I'm your host. This show is really all about um, telling, having Vermonters tell their amazing stories of their life, a chance to share with the audience um, all the different things that happen in, in a person's life. Consider it kind of a live obituary. You know, I've read many of those over the years, and I always left I always leave saying, gosh, I wish I got to know that person. Well, this show is about getting to know that person when they're alive and vital and still part of our community. And so um, I'm of the firm belief that everyone has a story to tell. And this is a show that will help tell those stories to, uh, to everyone. If you're interested in being a part of this show, um, please send me an email mail at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com, or if you have a question for our guests today, again, send me an email and I'll get it over to, um, to our guests at uh, celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Well, I'm honored today to have as our guest, Rich Feely. And Rich and I have actually known each other for a number of years and have had a great uh, back and forth over the years in my career, his career, and had some fun together too. So uh, welcome, Rich, to the show. It's great to be here, Gary. Thanks a lot for inviting me. And um, just for the audience's sake, we're both Jersey boys originally. That's and right. We've come to love and enjoy this great state of Vermont and wouldn't leave it for the world. So, um, so Rich, tell us your life story, but you know, maybe start when you were back in Jersey as a little kid, and um, I know you were in South Orange, if I'm not mistaken, or East Orange. Uh, I was uh, I was actually born in Newark in okay. uh, yep. 19, 1944 and was raised in the uh, what was referred to as the Oranges. I was I actually my family actually lived in South Orange and then uh, Orange, West Orange and then back to South Orange, okay. uh, all within uh, almost a couple blocks of uh, each one of our residences. I grew up in a, I would say, kind of a, a middle-income uh, Irish Catholic family. Um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, um, uh, I was born like right during World War II. Uh, my dad was uh, in the army overseas. Uh, uh, during the war, uh, he went in, uh, uh, I can't remember how, well, he went in, in, I think, uh, around 42, 43, got out and 45 or 46 i was born in 44 and my mother uh my mother's parents lived in south orange um my grandparents uh, my mom's uh, maiden name was Connolly. so both sides of my family are uh, irish uh and uh my first memories of my father were when i was a you know a very little kid maybe just a couple years old and sometimes you wonder whether they're real memories or things that people told you happened uh but uh so, so i lived with my grandparents uh with my mom uh for the first couple of years of my life and then uh and then we moved to an apartment complex in uh in orange orange was a pretty diverse uh community uh, uh kind of mainly catholic irish uh, uh, and uh pardon me irish italian and uh, african americans and mm -hmm. uh after living there for the first, uh, I think, seven years of my life, the, for, from years like three to five or six, we moved to West Orange, kind of across the brook. And then uh, and then later on, when I got into, I think I was going into high school, I went to, uh, we moved just back to South Orange. Mm -hmm. And most of my, uh, when I was a kid, uh, most of my memories of uh, my earlier life revolved around kind of the neighborhood and the kids in the neighborhood and, and mainly uh, sports was a big part of uh, athletics, uh, hanging out at the uh, local schoolyard, um, playing all kinds of games like uh, stickball, mm. softball, football, basketball, uh, and um uh, and I was, uh, as I am today, and as you are, I was a big uh, Yankee fan growing up. I grew up in the kind of in the late 40s and into the 50s. So 
Mm-hmm. When I was a little kid, uh, Joe DiMaggio was still playing, and uh, my father had season tickets at Yankee Stadium. So, oh boy, I used to go to a lot of Yankee games, uh, mm-hmm. both with my father and also with just some of the kids in the neighborhood. We would get on the Erie Lackawanna, Erie Lackawanna train and go to Hoboken, and then get on the tubes under the river, and then the subway that was called the D, the D train to mm-hmm. uh, Yankee Stadium and uh, got to know wow. a lot of the peanut vendors and wow, go out into the bowels of Yankee Stadium where I'd see some of the relief pitchers playing uh, poker to, uh, between games, <laughs> of a, between games of a double header and no kidding stuff like that. Uh, you know, I, uh, um, uh, my earlier memories with, uh, with my family, uh, mainly were with my mother's, uh, my mother's siblings and, and my mom's family rather than my father's family. Uh, my, my mother's family was, a uh, you know, very big was it nine, 10, 10, 11 kids, uh, Irish Catholic. My father, my grandfather was in the real estate business. Like I wound mm-hmm. up and actually later in his life, he wound up with an artificial leg. No way. I, yes. And he had a, he was a bald headed guy with a mustache and, uh, and uh, so I think I, in some re- ways, might be a re- reincarnation of my grandfather. Well, so for the audience' sake, um, you also have lost a leg, and we'll talk about that down yeah. the road. So yeah, that's an amazing. My, I spent most of my life as an amputee, so it's kind of ironic uh, that. Uh, Very ironic. My father. This happened to my grandfather. You know, later in his life, my father's family was. Uh, uh pretty well ra- rack with alcoholism and my grandfather uh my grandfather had been a pretty successful businessman in new york city and wound up uh you know uh, uh alcoholism took took him to a, a really dark place he left his family and wound up on the bowery and mm. wound up uh passing away a few years later and uh, and uh, so my father's family was uh, just kind of more like disjointed. His his brothers and sisters were sort of scattered hither and yon because of the breakup of their family when they were little kids. Sure. So there wasn't a lot of um, uh, family events with the Feely side of my family. It was mainly with the Connolly side. Yep. yep. And, um, so it was a kind of an, you know, I don't know. You look back on your life. Uh, it, w- it was uh, interesting uh, in some respects. Uh, you know, it was kind of a, on my, my my mom's side. It was kind of a fun environment with a, a lot of cousins and hanging out with them. And I was the o- oldest uh, boy cousin. I think I think my uh, my mom's uh, uh, siblings. They had like I think I had five or six cousins that were all girls ahead of me. And then I was the first, uh, first boy. boy cousin. And I was re- kind of referred to as the prince. And I was uh, kind of adored by my my girl cousins. And also I, I had a great relationship with my grandfather, Conley. Uh, he used to take me down to his real estate office on Saturday mornings and I'd uh, take me out for ice cream and stuff. And he and I got along uh, really well. Uh, and that actually, I think I, in some respects, got along better with him than anybody else in my family. Um, I was going to ask you who that special person was in your life when you were young. And it sounds like your grandfather might have been that person. Yeah. If, if I had anybody that I was close to, I would say it was him. Uh, mm-hmm. I wasn't very close to my parents. Uh, like, like like a lot of uh, families, like especially a lot of Irish families, there was a lot of, a, it was a, we were kind of referred to as a thirsty lot and uh, mm-hmm. a lot of drinking and uh, oh, I cult- see. Yeah. culture of my family was, uh, it was an awful lot of, uh, it seemed like there was always a cocktail party going somewhere, you know, going on mm-hmm. somewhere at somebody's house. And uh, uh, so it was a, uh, when I was growing up, uh, most of if I had any achievements um, that I made me feel good, they were usually um, they were usually sports related. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, I think uh, looking back on what I was like in school, 
uh, I don't know that I was ADHD, but I, I had a lot of trouble uh, concentrating. Um, I think I was uh, kind of anxious as a kid. Uh, some of it revolving around, uh, you know, what was going on in my own household. Sure. And, um, so I think, you know, escaping into the world of athletics and, and the neighborhood kids I used to hang around with. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I like a lot of little kids. I mean, b- baseball was a real big deal for me. I grew up in the, uh, in the era of the Yankees, the Dodgers and the Giants in New York City. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, half my friends were Yankee fans and the other half were either Dodger or Giant fans. <laughs> and uh, it was funny when I was uh, one of my most vivid memories as a kid was uh, uh, when I was really young, like nine, 10, 11, I was I was uh, average at best in baseball. And then my, when I, somehow at 12 years old, I kind of blossomed and became one of the better players in the little league and uh, made the all-star team. And then, uh, and then uh, I got picked, uh, there used to be a show on, uh, on WOR uh, before the Dodgers games. It was called happy Felton's not whole gang. Huh. And it was, it was a, it was a TV show where uh, a member of the uh, three, three kids from a little league would go, from any from any little league in the metropolitan area would go on the show and there's this big heavy guy kind of like a um i don't know what you call him he was a character anyway his name was happy felton he's dressed in a dodger uniform he was probably you know six foot 300 and uh <laughs> so he he was kind of a comedian of sorts and and a, a player would come out and meet the kids and and put these kids through the, their these baseball drills and they would pick the best player as a winner. And then, uh, and so I went on, it was uh, August of 1956. Wow. So it was on, it was on television. It's, it was a half hour show before a Do- the Dodgers game it was live TV. Yep. And I went on with these two other kids uh, and these poor kids I went on with, I, I don't know that they ever even caught one ball that was hit to them. I mean, they, they were really, really nervous. Uh-huh. And for some reason, I wasn't nervous at all. And, you know, I caught everything they threw to me. And uh, so I won. And I was Jim Junior Gilliam was the guy who picked me as the winner. Oh, my goodness. And uh, so every all the kids got a glove and a bat and a little savings account. And then the guy who the kid who won and you were there with your high school, your little league coach. Uh, and uh, and the next day you would go on the same show, the winner would and get a chance to ask whatever player they wanted a bunch of questions. Oh my goodness. And, and so I was a Yankee fan. I, I remember kind of like the most probably off the air. I asked Happy Felton if I could ask if I could see Phil Rizzuto who was a Yankee, you know. <laughs> and he kind of like made some kind of comment about I was a little wise guy or something. And then uh so I picked Pee Wee Reese. I went on the show. I talked to Pee Wee Reese. Reese asked him a bunch of questions on the air. And then after that, at, towards the end of the show, well, Happy Felton walked me down to the Dodger dugout and uh, on the air, and uh, and I got into the dugout and met all the Dodgers and uh, with this oh, ball I had that I said you know best shortstop tonight August something or other nineteen fifty six, and I met you know all the Dodgers that were in the dugout, which included most of the Dodgers and Jeez. and I got their autographs you know like uh, Gil Hodges, Pee Wee Reese, Jackie Robinson, Duke Snyder. Oh my goodness. Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale. Oh, Got a chance, actually. I sat there during the uh, right before the game started with uh, Koufax and uh, and Drysdale, and I had a chance. I talked to Sandy Koufax for about five minutes, and I remember Jackie Robinson. You know how he had a funny voice, and I remembered his voice. Uh, and Duke Snyder, I remember it looked like he hadn't shaved in about a week. My and, goodness. Uh, and uh, so, and both games, it was funny. Both games, the Giants beat the Dodgers. And the second game, Willie Mace hit a home run. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know if it's come down yet. I mean, he hit it. <laughs> it must have been 500 feet. And, um, wow. So that was, you, I remember, you, remember, you know, it's like you have little things in your life, you know, that you yeah. remember. That was one thing that I'll. Uh, That's an amazing story. And you were in the dugout during that doubleheader? Well, no, I was in the, it wasn't, it was one night 
well, I went on and got, they had these drills. Right. And I won. And then I went on the next night for the next game. Right. And I sat in the dugout just in the beginning of the game, just gotcha. uh, you know, maybe for the first half inning or something. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, and I got this ball and I still have the ball you signed, have the, by all, signed by all the Dodgers. And the uh, uh, antique road show might want to take a look at that. It was probably worth it. I don't know. It's worth quite a bit of money. I, I, would I, I actually so. wound up as a, somewhat as a result of that, uh, collecting uh, major league baseball uh, uh, paraphernalia and, and almost mm. all of it is uh, signed uh, stuff. Like I have uh Starting back then, I started, you know, mainly it was, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, I started uh, collecting stuff like um, at auctions and uh, eBay. Yeah. And so I have, you know, stuff like signed by Babe Ruth. And, oh, my goodness. Do you have Joe a Mickey? Maggio, Ted Williams. Uh, Mickey Honus, Mantle. Honus Wagner. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Roger, uh, Rogers Hornsby. Yeah, Hornsby. sure. So it became a kind of an obsession of mine. I'm, I, I definitely have a, a obsessive uh, compulsive personality, as you can probably tell from all the emails that I sent you as part of this <laughs> show. Um, oh, sorry. And, uh, so what's, Rich, let me ask you, um, who was your favorite baseball player growing up? Uh, probably Mickey Mantle. Mm -hmm. yep. I, I went, yeah, he was my, fa he was my favorite player. I, uh, yeah. He was an unbelievable uh, athlete. He had a lot of charisma. Yeah. I saw him hit some uh, just gargantuan home runs in Yankee Stadium live. Yeah. I remember seeing yeah. him hit a home run. I saw him hit a, hit a home run. It, it looked like it started off at about five feet off the ground and, and it kept rising. And it went into the dead center fields. Uh, they had a tarpaulin, like a black tarpaulin over the, right. yep. over the seats out there. Yep. It was 461 feet to dead center field then. And he hit it like, it was at least 500 and some odd feet. <laughs> and I bet it, it seemed like it took like two seconds to get there. Jeez. It was a, lot, it was a line drive and uh, the whole place went dead silent. It was just yeah. un unbelievable, you know? Wow. Wow. I also, I also liked uh, uh, Ted Williams, even though mm. he was uh, not a Yankee, but uh, I, I could recognize what an incredible uh, uh, hitter he was. And yeah. He was really, he was really a fun uh fun to watch him play and sometimes i was you know he would do a job on the yankees when he came to yankee stadium every once yep. in a while yeah yeah I, I would say probably uh the best players i ever saw play were probably Mantle, williams uh and uh willie mays yeah willie, May, willie yep. mays was Willie Mays is probably the best player I ever saw. You know, I wish I'd had an opportunity to see Babe Ruth play. I think he was probably the best player that ever played the game. Mm -hmm. He was so much better than anybody else that ever played, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so baseball, my wife, uh, Terry, who you know, uh, we've been married almost 55 years. And uh, I would say for the first 40 years of our marriage, she's slowly become an avid yankee fan now i would say it's gone from avid to rabid <laughs> to, to total mania well, I mean, I, if you were a fly on the wall of, of our house here especially when she and carlos stanton swings at a pitch outside the strike zone oh uh, yeah Right. They leave a pitcher in. They leave a pitcher in too long, and he starts uh, walking everybody. Uh, <laughs> this place lights up. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's really fun to uh, to watch. Really, she's become uh, probably a bigger fan, fan. I'm as big of a fan as I think I could be. Yeah, she's, right. She, she takes it just to another level. Another level. Oh, that's great. That speaks to the love between the two of you. Yeah, we're uh, we're we're pretty good team i think you know yeah you are <laughs> trying to get back uh you're talking a little bit you know like growing up uh you know i never did uh i i was probably like an average student uh mm -hmm. you know like in grammar school i went to a catholic grammar school we had you know nuns and anybody who's been through that experience it's sort of an interesting thing you know it's so they got like anything else in life they got nuns that were really good at what they did nuns that, nuns that weren't so good at what they did uh yeah. And I was, uh, you know, I don't think I, uh, you know, the attention that I got at home never seemed, uh, 
it never seemed all that positive. So uh, I didn't get a lot of, I didn't, you know, I think beyond everything else, I've always been sort of somewhat self-absorbed. So I was probably, I probably needed more attention or thought I did than I might've really needed. And mm -hmm. so acting out like in school, you know, uh, being a class clown, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think I played that role, uh, and, you know, it wasn't like a fun thing to do, but it seemed to be like my thing to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So I just, yeah. I think a lot of time, when I'm looking back on my life, I think I suffered from a lot of anxiety and didn't really, it was like never sort sure. of, di never diagnosed, you know, it was just sure. like part, yeah. of who I, part of who I was, you know? Richard, did, did you talk, did your family talk to you or the other kids about alcohol when you were young? about the you know how it the dangers of it and all that stuff no they were too busy uh you know i think like my parents i think they did as good a job as they could probably have done but um they were uh they were busy drinking yeah, yeah. they yeah. were i mean they were also busy living their lives they were involved in the community uh yeah uh you know i think i was well cared for like i lived in a nice house you know uh I lived in a, you know, everything I, I was given, I was, yeah. I, I wouldn't say I was privileged, but I was kind of average, you know, I feel like it was like middle America back in mm -hmm. the 50s and 60s. And, uh, but I think I, uh, you know, I look at what kids go through today and um, it seems like everybody's got a psychologist or a doctor giving them Ritalin or right. paying attention. And I don't think uh you know i i'm not you're i think a bit younger than me but maybe not by a lot and we were growing up i don't think there was like that kind of thing wasn't happening you know right like, right yeah you were kind of on your own and, uh, <clears throat> that's right yeah i, I remember kids uh you know uh, i remember when i was a little kid a kid uh committing suicide you know like he's 14 years old and People were like shaking their heads. Nobody could kind of come to grips with it, but I'm sure, you know, that kid was probably a troubled kid and, uh, and nobody sure. really, I don't know if anybody, we didn't know it in the neighborhood park where we hung out, you know, yeah. we, were just, we were just stunned when it happened, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, once I got out of grammar school, you know, say when I was like 15 or like 14, 15, I went to a, uh, you know, I mean, everybody kind of went to a Catholic school. It was sort of like the church, sure. you know? And I grew up in a community that was probably half Catholic and half Jewish. It was an interesting community. It was like Irish, Italian, a few African-Americans and a lot of Jewish people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a diverse community from a religious standpoint. This is South Orange, New Jersey. And uh, right. Right. In a lot of respects, it was a great town to grow up in. Uh, it was uh, had had everything from, you know, tenements to mansions. Uh, it was uh, it it was a, it was a nice town to grow up in. But uh, so I went to this Catholic high school, Seton Hall Prep, which is on the same oh, campus yes. as Seton Hall University, yep. and it was all boys and. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, pretty strict. You had to wear certain clothes to school. I think we had to wear a tie. And uh, and I uh, I never, uh, even though I did okay from a, an athletic standpoint there, I, I never really took to the place. Uh, mm. I don't know what it was. It, it was probably a combination of uh, maybe too much Catholicism, too many rules, no girls. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, it just seemed really stifling and uh and i that was about the time just about the time i was at seton hall is when i uh start my behavior uh started getting uh a, a pretty bad you know and it was all tied to uh, drinking you know i started drinking when i was in high school and uh you know i eventually was asked to leave seton hall prep uh, because mm. of my combination of my behavior and academics, but the academics was really because I just, I wasn't showing up for class. You know, I, I wasn't taking the tests, that kind of stuff. And yep, yep. Th things weren't good at home. And uh, and uh, I remember my after my sophomore year, I wanted to leave and the baseball coach wanted me to stay. So 
my parents kind of got some of us somehow we got talked into me staying to my into my junior year but i i left in the middle of my junior year i'd had enough and went to a large, went to a like large public school yeah it sounded almost like you <clears throat> you weren't able to say i don't want to be here but your actions basically said i don't want to be here right and, and right i think i was i think i was pretty immature you know uh like mm -hmm. socially immature i was uh, small I, I was, I think I was reason, reasonably intelligent, but, uh, you know, I just, I didn't have a lot of the social skills to be able to, to be, I, it didn't seem I took things very seriously. You know, I just yeah, yeah. never really got, never really kind of figured out the whole education part of it. You know, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? You know, right, right. It, it, yep. so I acted out, you know, and, um, yep. and uh, so, I wound up in public school and the public school I went to was a big school. And uh, a lot of kids that I kind of grew up with, uh, uh, maybe from the other side of the tracks, you know, uh, I kind of mm -hmm. up with those guys and uh, I, my behavior really got really bad mm -hmm. and my drinking really took off. And, uh, and uh, I was in trouble all the time, mm -hmm. both in the, not so much in school, a little bit in school, but outside in the community with the, uh, you know, the local, uh, like juvenile officers and people like that, you know? Right. Right. Yep. It, was all, it all related to alcohol, you know, too much, drinking too much, just over, yep. Going yep. way over the top. I never really, when I started drinking, I didn't really start like a lot of kids did with this, you know, buying a six pack or something. I hung out with a couple of guys that were my own age and we just sort of drank whiskey. Yeah. And I yeah. Hung out hung out on the street corner and uh and yeah. got into a lot I got into trouble. It just seemed like it was trouble just was like following following me around. And sure. at the same time I was still that same uh, kind of like confused, uh, anxious kid. Mm -hmm. I don't think I really in, in a lot of respects had a I don't think I ever had like a mean bone on my body, but I was attracted to the excitement of trouble. Yep. Um, yep. But I didn't want to hurt anybody. I just, uh, right. I just think liked acting out. Yeah. 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 And, and <clears throat> you went, so with all that going on, you, you graduated, I know, and you went to St. Michael's. How did that, how did you pull that off? Uh, I think what happened to me was uh, I went to this prep school. I took most of the courses that like, like in a public school, you'd have to take to graduate by the time I was a, in my junior year. Mm. So when I, when I went to public school, uh, I wound up uh, my senior year. It was kind of comical. I took uh, record keeping, wood shop, uh, typing. Uh, okay. uh, what else did I take? Economics, uh, gym. I had a couple of study halls and I was on the baseball team. So I got an extra study hall. I guess I didn't have to go to gym because I was on the baseball team. I can't remember, but I got like mostly A's because I was huh. taking these gut courses, you know, I was taking these courses. All the kids in my class were all kids who weren't going to college. Right. So I, I already taken all the courses you needed to take to go to college. Gotcha. And then I took the college boards and I did okay. You know, I mean, I didn't set the world. You know, I was above average, but not yeah, a lot yeah. above average. Yeah. So I wound up applying to like four colleges. None of them were, I say Mike's was the Harvard of the schools I applied to. I applied to like Stonehill College, Bryant College in Providence and Nichols, Nichols College in Dudley, Massachusetts. And I never forget my visit to Nichols because I was there with my parents and uh, I never visited St. Mike's before I went there, but I, I, I went to Nichols and I remember walking around the campus and there was a big sign hanging out of, off a balcony at one of the dorms that said like 28 kegs tonight. Oh, jeez. <laughs> my, fa my father said, well, I guess I know where you want to go to school. Oh, brother. <laughs> but I didn't go there. I guess I thought better of it. And I, mm. I wound up coming to St. Mike's. I'd never... Uh, Never seen the school. Mm. I heard it was a pretty good school. There was a lot of there was a lot of guys from Jersey there. Um, I, I still to this day don't know why I have picked an all men's school. Yeah, I, Catholic I, all men's school. Because I a Catholic all men's school here. I, I've been in a Catholic all men's high school, and 
didn't like it. And so I came up right. to St. Mike's and uh, by that time, you know, I was, uh, I would, you know, it was a good thing for me to get out of town. I'll just put it that way. I'm in yep. Jersey. Yep. I mean, I think they, they were tired of me. I was tired of it. And, uh, but I came to St. Mike's and uh, I remember that like maybe the first or second day I was here in Burlington. So this was 60 years ago. I got here, you know, 1962 and mm. this era, you know, it was quiet up here. It was really quiet. <laughs> And the first day, uh, this guy in my class, he was 21. He'd been in college for four years. And I th- he, had, he was still a freshman. Oh, my he's, gosh. He was a character. So he said, let's go into Burlington. So we started walking down the hill from St. Mike's and came over the hill. And, and we thought we were going into Burlington, but we were heading into Winooski. And I, and I came over the hill and I looked down into Winooski and it almost brought tears to my eyes because it was just... It was not, it was a, a raggedy town, Winooski, back then. Yeah. It was not, yeah. it was a lot different than the Winooski you see today. Yes. And remember, we yeah. walked down, we walked down the hill and we got in, we went into the uh, Mill Cafe in Winooski, which was a, was a college bar. Julie Melanson and her husband, Phil, owned it. And uh, I walked in there and I was 18, he was 21. And his name was Sullivan. And uh, so Julie asked us for an ID. And so he gave him, he gave her his draft card and he handed me his driver's license under the table. And I gave him, I gave Julie his driver's license. So she was looking at two pieces of ID with the same name on it. And I, I was able to drink there. Oh my goodness. Ever since then Mm. under the name Sullivan until I got older and I started using my own name, but uh, you know, my, uh, my, when I was at St. Mike's, uh, you know, it was my really my f- first time kind of away from home. And uh, I felt like I would had a dr- arrived in like uh, Mayberry, you know, compared mm-hmm. to Jersey. And it really yeah. kind of blew it kind of blew me away. I mean, I, when I was the first year I was at St. Mike's, I was not a happy guy. The, the smallness of it all. It was just too hokey. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? It was yeah. just too hokey. It's just as, uh, but, you know. A lot of my buddies at St. Mike's were Jersey boys, and uh, and a lot, a lot of them actually didn't make it out of freshman year. Mm. But you know, as time went on, uh, you know, I I uh, uh, I think my drinking, you know, was really really was. By the time I got to St. Mike's, I, I was I I'm certain I was already an alcoholic, and uh, you know, mm. so it didn't get any better when I got here. Um, and, uh, you know, my, I was a, a guy who was smart enough to be able to kind of get, uh, get you know, find a way to uh, master the art of getting a C yeah. and I kind of get by. And, uh, and that, you know, sort of like uh, my, my, my history at St. Mike's was similar to my history in high school. The middle of my junior year was like 1964, five, I think. I decided I didn't want to go to college anymore. So I, I, I had a girl at Trinity made me up a sign which said uh, Miami Beach on it. I went out on the highway and put it out and, and so I sold my car and withdrew from the college and, wow. uh, and put my sign out and uh, it's from Miami Beach. And I got a ride. The guy was going all the way to Baltimore. And I said, why don't we stop my uh, phone in uh, Jer- Jersey? I want to see if a couple of my friends who were on leave, going to be on leave from the Marines were home. So they happened to be home with big mistake. I stopped. And that night was, uh, I won't go into the details, but I uh, wound up uh, uh, under lock and key mm. <laughs> and, and nothing really, really bad, but uh, yeah. yeah, wound up driving a cab in my hometown for six months. Uh, uh, I was the only uh, Caucasian cab driver. It was an interesting experience. And after six months of driving a cab, I wound up, uh, I said, you know, maybe I'll think about going back to college. Mm. So I talked to my dad and he agreed to send me back. And so I came back, I left St. Mike's in February and I went back in October. So that was 1965. And uh, St. Mike's didn't have semester. So I had to start all over again, my junior year. Yep. And uh, so I, uh, that was the year I met my wife, uh, Terry, uh, who was, she was a, I was a junior at St. Mike's. Uh, she was a freshman at Trinity and uh, mm. we met in an apartment building downtown. Uh, she came down to borrow 
one of my friend's cars and I fell like head over heels in like 30 seconds. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and uh, we've been together ever since. Uh, wow. and, I, and actually we owned that apartment building for like, uh, after I, after I, no kidding. after I got out of college, we bought it and we owned it for like 35 years. And uh, I was going to put a plaque on the side of that building. But <laughs> it never did. But we got married. We got married uh, right after I graduated from St. Mike's, and uh, and I uh, got a job at the Howard Bank in Burlington. Mm. And I graduated on a Sunday from St. Mike's and uh, started working at the bank as like a management trainee. And that was uh, 1967 in September of 67, uh, pardon me, in June of 67. And then September of 67, we got married. And uh, just a couple months later, Terry got pregnant and uh, she was at Trinity. So she went through her junior year pregnant. And then my son, our son, Brad, was born in uh, in uh, July of 68 when she was going into her senior year. So she was carrying around our son in a backpack and also in a stroller her senior year in college while I was working at the Howard mm -hmm. Mack, she was also working at uh, the uh, University of Vermont in a bio lab for Madeline Cunin's husband, huh. Dr. Yeah. Arthur Cunin. And uh, yeah. so we started our family, you know, we, they were living in, we lived in Burlington and then we moved to Winooski and lived there. And then, uh, and then bought our first home. We were really young. We were like, maybe 25 and 22 out in Colchester. We bought a house, a little kind of a shack on Marble Island Road. It was like $17,000, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. I was working for the Howard Bank and uh, and uh, like in 19, we were married, you know, we had, we had Brad, he was just, he was born in 68. And then, uh, and then 1970, uh, uh, I was playing a, a friend of mine started a rugby club at UVM and they didn't have enough, uh, they didn't have enough uh, students to field a team. So they, they asked local business people who had some athletic ability to play. So I decided to play. And in, uh, that was 1969, 1970, uh, and I, I was playing in a game in Montreal for UVM. We were playing a Canadian team, a West Mount rugby club. They were like, you know, adult older guys and a uh, uh, horrific injury, a uh, horrific, uh, I, was, I got tackled and uh, uh, just had a horrible, horrific knee injury. It's you know, hardly even, it, it was just really, really bad. And uh, mm -hmm. as a result of that injury, my knee, knee got dislocated so bad that uh, I wound up having to have my leg amputated. That's amazing. Uh, above my yeah. knee, I was 20, I just turned 26 and uh married with one little boy and uh so yeah. i was in the hospital up there for a couple months uh i had pro i had uh, uh be i had wound up with a uh, gangrene and i my huh. renal i had my kidneys started uh break it breaking down uh mm. so in the meantime the howard bank uh where i had worked was incredibly good to me the whole time i was there they paid my salary uh they told me not to worry about anything they they'd pick up you know they pay my salary until I get back to work. Wow. And I, uh, so Terry was going back and forth to Montreal while I was in the hospital. She stayed for a while. We have this little kid and. Wow. I was, uh, you know, petrified about what was going to happen, you know, to us. Like sure. financially, we didn't have any money at all. And, uh, wow. but, uh, you know, the bank really took care of me. And uh, wow. when, I came, when I came back to, uh, to Vermont, like a couple months after I got hurt, I got fitted for an artificial leg and, uh, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of, I, I don't know. My attitude was sort of like, I guess I got to get back to work, you know? Yeah. 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 And, yeah. I did, I, I, and, uh, so I got to the, was at the bank and I decided for some reason, uh, this kind of close encounter with death or a real serious injury made me mm. uh, decide I wanted to do something with my life. So I went to the president of the bank and told him I was pretty naive. I said, you know, I, he was a really good guy. And I said, I, uh, I want to talk to you about it. I want to be somebody. I don't mm -hmm. want to be sitting down in the basement of the bank here running an adding machine. I want to, right. so well, who do you want to be? I said, well, I wouldn't mind your job someday. 
And uh, he, he laughed. He brought over the executive VP of the bank. He said, well, you know, listen to what this little guy has to say, you know. And mm. So I told him all this and uh, they, and he said, you come back in a week and we're going to have a job for you. And you, he says, I don't have any doubt you're going to be somebody. So I came back a week later and they had this. It was a pretty big, responsible thing. It was a starting a new department. And uh, mm. so mm. I did I did that. I went down to New York City to kind of copy what the first national city bank had for a department. And I went back to, back to the Howard and in, instituted that and rose, uh, became a commercial loan officer, rose pretty fast in the bank. Uh, wow. Became like, uh, you know, some people they have a, uh, something like that happened to them in their life. It can it kind of change in one of two ways, you know, they either become right. know, nervous and depressed or they just kind of like take off. And that's kind of gonna- what happened to me. I was going to ask you about that because I, I think we've talked about this. My father had lost his leg in World War II above the knee like yourself. And he went on to have a, an amazing life and never let it slow him down. If anything, he was even more determined to be successful because of that. Then I've seen another, my next door neighbor up in Buffalo, same thing. He lost the leg above the knee and he was depressed and he just, curled up in a ball and and gave up on life it's hard so, to know i think yeah. a lot of, i think a lot of it with me was uh who i was married to uh, yeah. i was married to a real uh spark plug and uh i got an incredible amount of support yeah and uh you know uh and i think that had a lot to do with it you know i really wanted to i wanted to do something i i, I wanted to be sort of be somebody you know and uh yeah. I spent my whole life, you know, so anxious and unsure of myself. And then all of a sudden I had this thing happen to me. And it was like, uh, in some respects, it was like a gift, you know, Mm -hmm. like uh, people say things like that. Something really bad happens to them, you know. It turned the light bulb on for you, didn't it? Yeah, it turned the light bulb on. And, uh, you know, so sort of going forward our our second son Seth was 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 born in 1971 and uh you know that was uh, I, I, I stayed at the Howard Bank until um uh 19 I, I lose track of the years here but uh my wife uh my wife uh, had an interest keen interest in politics her father had been involved in the Democratic Party in Connecticut and so she was uh uh, I think it was like in the, say, the mid seventies, uh, she decided she was going to run. We were living in Colchester. She decided she was going to run for political office. So she, so she ran for the Vermont state legislature against an incumbent out here. And, uh, she, and she worked her rear end off and, uh, she won mm. and she wound up serving, uh, three terms in the legislature as a Democrat. And, uh, that's great. It was about the same time that I was, uh, you know, um, reconsidering what I wanted to do with my life because back in those days, uh, you know, uh, I never really kind of like when I envisioned myself, I didn't sort of envision myself as a banker. I never thought I was kind of like, uh, I don't know about serious enough or that driven to make money for like an institution or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like parts, parts of being a banker. It was kind of fun helping people get started in their own business and stuff like that. But uh, so I found, I decided uh, I had been doing some work for a local real estate company. Uh, one of my customers, Hickok and Boardman, and I decided it was a couple of guys, uh, people there selling real estate. And I said, I, you know, I saw a real need for a commercial real estate brokerage in, in Burlington because there wasn't really anybody doing it that was very successful at it. And I thought with my background as commercial lending, I could yeah. probably do pretty well at it. And uh, so I went to work for them for like a year and I, uh, I got, I, it was really weird. I mean, it was like, a, like the guy you see, I remember Bert Campanaris when he broke into the major leagues, he had a home run his first time up. Mm-hmm. That's sort of what happened to me. I was in a business like just a matter of a couple of weeks and I made this huge sale and made more, made probably twice as much money as I'd ever made working in the bank in a year. And um, I said, boy, this is, uh, this is easy. <laughs> I sold, I sold a place downtown. I don't know if you were around that. It was, 
B T McGuire's and Hannibal's. It was a bar right oh, across. Oh sure. The oh yeah. Wall. Yep. So I sold that place for a couple of guys I went to school with at St. Mike's, they, and uh, it was a big sale. Big. Everyone was talking about it, and all of a sudden I was kind of like uh, kind of the golden boy, you know. And uh, so I really liked it. I liked the attention. I, I liked. Mm. You know, I never had really never had any money in my pocket before. My wife and I and. Uh, so she was off, you know, uh, doing a, a, a political thing. And I, yeah. you know, and I was a Hickok and Boardman and I was, uh, I was only there about a year. And I, one of my friends, Tom Coburn, uh, he had an insurance company, which I'd helped uh, finance when I was with the bank. Hmm. And he and I got together one day and I told him about my idea of starting a commercial real estate company. And he liked the idea. Uh, I didn't have a, you know, two, two nickels to rub together. And uh, uh, he didn't have a lot, but but he had a lot of confidence in himself. And uh, mm-hmm. and he was uh, really calm, cool, and collected. He was sort of the opposite of me. I was more high strung, like a high strung, I don't know, dog or thoroughbred or something, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And he was like, uh, you know, he was just really a, a cool, calm, cool guy. Mm. And uh, so we hooked it up together and, uh, you know, we, we, we just... We kind of hit it off from the beginning and i think we were at the right place at the right time in burlington when things were really starting to hum and um it was like it was right before it was right before the sanders phenomenon took place in burlington in the 70s late 70s late 70s yeah, yeah. and uh we bought a building on college street when there wasn't anything going on on college street down by bennington potters yeah bought a building there for like nothing didn't have no money down, you know, that back in the days when you could do that kind of thing. And wow. banks were making these character loans to people they thought, you know, they could, wow. they'd find a way to pay them back. You know, they knew where they lived, that kind of stuff, you know? Yes. And uh, so, you know, we, I just, one thing led to another. I kept buying, you know, buying real estate, selling real estate. And, uh, and I became more and more uh, uh, self-confident, but then, you know, I was still drinking at the time. And uh, yeah, I, ask you about my, I remember my partner said to me one day something like, uh, I don't know if our relationship will be uh, long term because there's a part of me that always wonders whether you're going to drive off the King Street dock some night, half mm-hmm. in the bag. Mm-hmm. And it kind of hit me between the eyes. We were at one of these mm-hmm. self-help things where you would say what you really thought you know yeah yeah back in those self-help kind of days uh people were giving those kind of seminars you know and uh kind of hit me between the eyes and then uh i started thinking about not drinking i'd had a couple of dwis uh you know a lot of people knew me in burlington they knew my wife uh you know and a lot of people were like hoping maybe i might see the light and then I don't know how much time we have, Gary. I, I was going to ask you, uh, do we have some more time? Yes, we do. So what happened to me was I, uh, 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 somewhere along the line, I wound up as, as one of the owners of Sneakers Restaurant in Winooski. And I was over there one morning after having had a really bad night drinking and uh, ran into one of my partners, Billy Hunter, who owned uh, all Sneakers. He owned the restaurant at Forest Hills. He owned uh, the Ice House restaurant and he had owned BT McGuire's and Hannibal's and we were good friends. And I guess I'd been a real kind of jerk the night before and said some things to him that I still don't know what I said, but he told me, he said, if you don't do something about your drinking, I don't want to be your friend anymore. And I certainly don't want to be your partner. So mm-hmm. it, somehow or another, it just hit me right in the heart. And uh, I yeah. remember it was like uh, November of 1982 and I was standing in front of sneakers it was kind of chilly and I felt like uh, somebody tore uh, pulled the skin right off my body or something. And it just, I was like, like terrified, you know, mm. I got in my car, drove downtown to my office on college street. Cause I had to meet a guy to go look at a building. I had listed at 45 Clark street in Burlington. And, uh, and uh, so I pull up in front of my, and I'm thinking to myself, I got to stop drinking. I got to stop drinking mm. and God help me, you know, Okay. Yeah. I still had a, I still had a belief in, in a, in God and some kind of a higher power. I think that, you know, 16 years of Catholic education, some of it sunk in. Right. And uh, so this guy's waiting for me at the front door, isn't it? And I said, are you looking for Rich Feely and my, uh, down on College Street? And he said, yes. He said, hop in. That's me. 
he had set up an appointment with my secretary to see this building. So I, I didn't really, I don't even know if I had his name. She just told me, you got a meeting with a guy here, you know, 10 o'clock. Um, it was November 15th, I think, 1982. Hmm. So I'm driving down College Street. I'm thinking, I got to stop drinking. This poor guy sitting next to me, you know, and I got my mind's elsewhere. And yeah. I'm pulling, pulling in front of what now is the Hilton Hotel on Battery Street and uh, the old Ramada Inn or whatever it was, Radisson, yeah. I think. And uh, I turned to this guy. I'm thinking, I got to stop drinking. I turned to this guy and I said, so what's your interest in this building and what organization are you with? He said, you might know the name. He says to me, well, my name's, um, now I'm not going to be able to, Dave Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. I'm the executive director of Champlain Drug and Alcohol Services, and we help people with alcohol and drug problems. Wow. So I'm sitting <laughs> in my car, I'm sitting in my car, and Perfect. I felt like a lightning bolt lit up the inside of my car. Wow. And I heard these three words, this is it mm. in my head. And I, and I turned to this guy and I said, did you hear that? He said, did you hear what? And I said, oh, never mind." Wow. And I said, I mean, I wasn't a super religious guy and I'm still not, but I, I kind of had an idea who was in the back seat of my car. Yeah. And it was uh, a guy who's usually very busy. And I didn't think he had an awful lot of time for me. So he said, this is it. Mm -hmm. So I pull over to 45 Clark Street, park in the parking lot. And I kept asking this guy, Dave, how do I quit drinking? How do I quit drinking? I got a drinking problem. This poor guy who is dealing with wow. alcoholics all day long is finally out for a break looking at a building says to me, uh, Rich, listen, I got some questions about the building. You can answer my questions. I'll tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. So I handed him this fact sheet for the building and walked him around the building and I uh, got back out in the parking lot. And he gave me his card and he said, uh, I think we want to buy the building. So why don't you come over in a couple hours and, and we'll write up an offer and you can, and I'll tell you what you got to do about your drinking. So I went over there, they wrote up an offer. Now, long story short, they bought the building. I never drank again. Wow. And I was their first customer. I was, wow. their first, I was their first client when they were moving furniture in the building. Wow. And uh, I got counseling there. And then uh, wow. I'd also had a, you know, I smoked a lot of marijuana. So she told me I had to stop smoking that. But she said, you can take your time with that. So I, over six months, I stopped. So I was, you know, May of 1983 is what, I consider my sobriety date. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a gift, you know, that, that, what that guy said to me in front of sneakers that morning, you know, who knows, yeah. you know, the way things happen in life, who knows what yeah. would have happened to me with my family and my business if I hadn't lost my leg, yeah. who knows what would have happened to me if that guy hadn't said that to me in front of sneakers that morning. That's great. That's great. So I think like you just never know in life what, uh, what what it has in store for you and what what thing might happen to you or that might completely change your whole direction because yep. Yep. you know once once i started uh you know once i started uh dealing getting into recovery my whole life just completely changed i mean it became like you know it took time i mean it happened over it's now been, uh, you know, almost 40 years. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I've been, I've been blessed, you know, yes. I, I, I feel like, uh, like, I don't know what would happen in my life if I hadn't have found a way into this uh, uh, life of recovery. Right. You know, it, it, the one thing that I'm taking from some of what you were just saying is that there was a part of you that was open to hearing what those people were telling you, your friends, your partners, uh, the guy that you sold the building to. I mean, you could have, another rich feel, they could have let those things just go by and not not see those as um, potential turning points in your life. Absolutely. You, you, Absolutely. You, got, you, you let it in. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and, and as, you know, that, that was sort of, uh, what was that, you know, that's 40 years ago, the last 40 years of my life, you know, probably 20 years of that were taken up you know, working my rear end off, uh, yeah. 
in the real estate business and, uh, you know, had some success at that. And as a, as a real estate developer, I think wow. you were on the board. Were you on the city council when I was uh, board of aldermen when I was yeah. South Meadow? Uh, yes, I was. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so that was, uh, that was one of the, I remember, uh, I can't imagine, uh, you know, having gone through, having to go through something like that when I was, uh, right. Uh, drinking. I mean, it wouldn't right. have worked, you know? Right. <laughs> and uh, and I, I did find out doing that, that that specific process uh, really wasn't my cup of tea. You know, I really wasn't. Uh, some people were really good at that, like maybe mm -hmm. somebody like Eric Farrell or right. Burlington, Burlington Housing Trust or other people who are more. Uh, some people are just really good at that kind of thing. And yeah, right. I was re I was really I thought I was. Uh, you know, I, I did a pretty good job as a landlord and owning real estate and being a, a steward of property and taking care of it and and running a running a you know a, a real estate business and stuff like that. Uh, because you know, I think generally, I you know, I care about people, I care about the community. Yes. Um, and uh, so much of that came uh, as a result of kind of finding out who I really am and, right. and that I'm really not. You know, I'm not the person I thought I was when I was younger. I'm, I'm you know, I'm just, exactly. I'm, I'm just another person trying to add some positive things to the world, you know, and yes. and also enjoy my life and not. Uh, and I found out, you know, also it took me a while because I had, I had some success, you know. It took me a while to sort of kind of get over myself a little bit because mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. like. Burlington, a town like Burlington, you know, if you're successful in a town like Burlington, you, you know, it's a small town and a lot of people are paying attention to you and it's kind of easy to get caught up in your own self-importance, you know, that you think that you're yeah. special or something. And maybe you are kind of, we're all special in our own way. Right. I know what you mean. But not that we're better than anybody else, you know? Right. Right. So Rich, tell me, because I think uh, in some ways this is a foundational piece of your life. Tell me about you and Terry. She's played a big part of who you are today. Yeah, I mean, she's a, she's just such a gem, you know. I uh, uh, I probably cry here. I don't know what, you know, uh, I was, I, you know, I was lucky. lucky. I When I was growing up, uh, I didn't have a lot of experience with girls, you know. I mean, I had, I had probably the average number of girlfriends, but I never knew, really knew how to act around girls or I never felt comfortable around girls. But, uh, you know, with her, I've, I've always, one thing I've noticed in my life though, has always been any girls that I ever been attracted to are usually kind of smart. Mm -hmm. My father told me one time growing up, he and I didn't get along well, but I remember him telling me, you know, make sure you hook up with a girl who's smarter than you. Mm -hmm. And he would, then he would say some snide comment, like, well, shouldn't be all that hard. Oh, uh, yeah, right. But he was right, you know. Uh, it's so much fun to go through life with a mate, you know, somebody who you really care about and who really cares about you and, yep. you know, somebody to talk with and, uh, you know, bounce things off of. And, uh, you know, you know, nobody's, there's no way you're ever going to go through life with a that, what you might, I, I don't think a perfect relationship, you know, it's right. It's hard enough to have a, a good relationship just with yourself. And then when you bring somebody else into the mix, uh, but, you know, having a, having a, a, a team member, a mate, uh, you know, a, you know, a spouse is, uh, it's been such an important part of my life. You know, I mean, she's, uh, she, what well, she's kind of, I mean, I, I know where she comes from, you know, she's the, she's the mm -hmm. oldest of nine kids mm -hmm. in a French Canadian Catholic family in Connecticut that grew up in a, you know, they didn't have anything, you know, and uh, I spent a summer at her house before we got married. Uh, she was a nanny on the beach in, uh, in uh, Rhode Island and I was living for some reason, her mother asked me to stay at the house. I was working on the railroad, the New Haven Railroad that summer in, in her hometown. And uh, the toughest job I ever had in my life, working on like a road gang, you know? I oh, my goodness. Found it in spikes and wow. moving ties around, stuff like that, you know? 
but I lived in her house and, you know, there were like nine kids and uh, mm. her parents and one bathroom mm. and, uh, you know, wow. three, four kids to a bedroom. And uh, so she, you know, she didn't have it easy as a kid, uh, but it, it, what, it, what was, it was what she was used to. And uh, she brought a lot of that to the table when, when we got married. I mean, she was, yeah. uh, she, first of all, she, as I said, when, when I was sitting in that, apartment at 206 maple street in burlington she walked in the apartment and you know you see those like in a in a cartoon or comic strip where they have the little cupid with the arrow yeah the little stars and the and the hearts and stuff mm -hmm. that's like <laughs> that's that was me I was, <laughs> I was like i was like just blown away that had never <laughs> happened to me before that's it never so happened to me before and it's never happened to me since you know yep that's great. And I just said to myself, there's no way that, that I'm letting this girl get away. I mean, uh -huh. It's not going to happen, you know? And, uh, <laughs> so, you know, she, you know, if she's, she has, uh, she, she doesn't drink. She quit drinking, you know, long, many, many years ago, 35 years ago. And um, so our relationship is a lot of it's based on, you know, respect. And, uh, I mean, we're, we're a couple of characters, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're different, I think in, in, in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, it's been, uh, especially the last few years with this, we're both, uh, you know, bent to the left politically, mm -hmm. probably, probably moderate to liberal, like more like the old type liberal than yep. a liberal of today. So we, we agree on a lot of, we agree on a lot of uh, things in life, a lot of political things in life uh, about the way the world should be and all the rest of that, you know, and, you know, we've had our issues over the years, like any couple would have, uh, but uh, we were able to find a way, you know, like uh, we had a problem, find a way to uh, put that in the past, you know, like suck it up, uh, say, well, you know, uh, you don't want to match scorecards, you know, if you're, if you're married, you know, it's like, uh, you know, like who, you know, who did, you know, like if somebody, I don't know, forgets to do something and you want to get mad at them, uh, right. you know, like, didn't you forget to do something too? You know, like, of course. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you really gotta kind of, you know, you gotta be able to, uh, compromise, find the art of compromise is really important, you know? And, uh, I really, I really love her. She's a really, she's a really good person. She's a really nice woman. Uh, I, I, I like, uh, uh, trying to make her happy. And, uh, we have a pretty, uh, pretty simple life in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, my kids say to me, dad, you know, something like, you know, why don't you buy some big condo, you know, for $2 million or something. We got a little camp here on the beach and I don't know if I can show you my, uh, I'm looking out oh. the window. You probably can't see because it's so bright. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. See wow. the lake right there? Yep. That's the lake. You know, there's our beach. It's uh, wow. You know, we're is, that, like, is that Mallet's Bay? Yes, Mallet's Bay. We're right, you know, you know, we paid beautiful. like 40 grand paid like 40 grand for this place, you know, <laughs> 35 years ago. And uh <laughs> we fixed it up, but it's a it's our little piece of heaven. And uh yeah. Down in Florida, we live in a, you know, middle America kind of community. And it's not like uh, some, you know, it's not a, I don't know what you want to call it. It's not a rich man's. Right. You know, we never, neither, us have, neither of us have ever been into that kind of putting out those kind of airs, you know? Right, right. You're real people. It doesn't really seem like there's any point to that. It, it just seems so artificial, you know? Yeah. So um, thank you for sharing your your life with Terry. That, I think that's an important part of who you are. <clears throat> Anything in life that you haven't done that you want to do? I'm going to tell you one other thing about Terry before Please. I forget about it. Yeah. Whenever I went to a bank in Burlington, which was very often to borrow a lot of money for stuff that I did, building stuff, yeah. they would unver invariably ask, how's Terry doing? <laughs> because they knew that yeah how terry was doing was how i was doing mm. and as long as she was part of the team mm. her chances of getting repaid were probably 
very high multiples of what <laughs> it would be if I was out there being the old rich feely, you know. Wow, that's amazing. Things I things I haven't done. Uh, you know what? I, I don't really think so. Uh, we've talked about you know, like we've been. I, I've been to Ireland a lot. Uh, I got you know cousins over there. Uh, I like Ireland. I I have some inner ear problems that make that make it a little scary for me to fly now. So everything I think about going anywhere, it's usually I want to go by car. I thought about we thought about maybe going to like Nova Scotia, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as doing anything, I think just uh, being able to spend time with our family. We have, you know, two sons. They're like 54 and 51. Got two granddaughters that are 20, 23 and 20. Mm -hmm. One graduated from UVM. The other is uh, is uh, going to be a junior at Salve Regina University in, in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Our two sons, are they live in Washington, D.C. and in... Uh, Fairfield, Connecticut. They're really good guys. Uh, we get along with them great. Uh, That's great. So we've had uh, we've been really uh, been really lucky. I, I think you know, uh, as long as I keep uh, living my life one day at a time, yep. not getting caught up in yesterday or tomorrow. Yep. I'm just uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to live my life uh, sober. Yes. Yeah. It's the whole thing. It's the whole. Uh, I went to a meeting last night. You know, I still, I, I still uh, try to be vigilant. Even uh, people ask me, you know, like, what are you uh, concerned about after all these years? And I just say, you know, uh, you never know. Exactly. You never yeah. know, and once you start, you know, once you start uh, taking uh, uh, that, especially sobriety for granted. Uh, you yep. can be in, a, be in a lot of trouble. I yep. would like to see one of my biggest concerns right now, and I have to be careful that I don't get obsessed by it, is what's going on in our country mm. politically. Um, it's, it, it's really difficult. I remember the days when, you know, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill could go out and have a couple of beers and settle a problem. And yep. um, these politicians today don't even seem to be able to do something like that. And I don't know how we're ever going to make any headway in this country as long as we have people that just won't talk with each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you're absolutely right. People, people, people got to learn how to talk with each other. Otherwise uh, <clears throat> it's going to be uh, painful. Uh, it's going to be painful to, uh, to watch what goes on in the United States. I'm, I'm so glad I live here rather than anybody else, but, uh, but than anywhere else, but uh, yeah, it's, it's going to, it's a challenge. So. Yeah, I would agree with you, Rich, for sure. Well, listen, anything you want, we're going to wrap up soon. Anything you want to say that hasn't been said? Anything that you want to put other, on the table? Other than the fact that when I was 17, me and another guy in my neighborhood had a workout tryout with the New York Yankees in Yankee Stadium. Oh, my goodness. In August of 1961. Wow. When the Eminem boys were going for the uh, home run record. Yes. And I got a chance to stand in the, at home plate at Yankee Stadium at batting practice. And I didn't, I think I got one ball out of the infield. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got home that night. My father said, How did you do? I said, Well, I found out what I'm not going to be doing for a living. Wow. <laughs> but I had, but I had my shot. You did. Isn't that amazing? How many people can say that? Not many. Not many, but I that's, had my shot. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. You had your shot. You know. And in, in your life, you've had your shot, too, and you've made the most of it, Rich. I've tried hard, and, uh, and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, for my life, and I'm grateful uh, to you and, uh, and for asking me to say a few words. Well, you're more than welcome. Thank you again for everything. Okay, buddy.